Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to our midweek Bible study, and I hope you've had a beautiful day today. I know that uh, when we have sunshine and even when we have rain this time of year, the beautiful green around us with the leaves and the trees blossoming out and, and the sound, even the sound of lawnmowers is something I like to, to hear at this time of year, but it reminds us of the of what God has blessed us with in nature. And so I hope you've had a beautiful day uh, enjoying uh, this t- springtime of year and that uh, you'll continue to enjoy the rest of your week. Uh, so uh, what we're doing this evening is continuing uh, what we began last Sunday, or last Wednesday, as we uh, were studying about the uh, discipleship that Jesus had called his followers to. And as a disciple is a learner, and Jesus called his disciples and he asked them to uh, come and see, and that meant that he wanted them to come and see where he lived and what he was doing, and he wanted to teach them and as, as their master teacher, their rabbi, and they were his students. So all of us really are called to, this, to discipleship as well. So last week we saw that Jesus went about, after he had begun his ministry, he went about preaching repentance and the kingdom of heaven being at hand. Now what he was really saying was that the kingdom of heaven was in him that he represented, he personified the kingdom of heaven. And we saw how the kingdom of heaven is who he is and what he has declared and what he wills. And so he's saying to everybody, listen to what I have to say because it it's represents the kingdom of heaven and the will of God. And so Jesus called his disciples to follow him and to listen to what he had to teach them. So we introduced two exhortations from Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount as he had seen the multitudes and he kind of needed to get away so he could uh, really focus on these 12 guys that he called to follow him and so that they could learn from him and be as he is. And that's really what the kingdom of heaven is in our lives, is to be as Jesus is. And so this is what he said initially in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So a person is blessed or has a, a life that's a life of wholeness or well-being, a uh, happy, uh, not necessarily happy, but just a person who has a, a sense of blessedness about the interior of their souls, uh, is if they are able to recognize, first of all, their spiritual poverty and turn to a better way that is the kingdom of God. And so if the kingdom of heaven is personified by the life of Jesus, then the person who is humble enough to admit uh, that he is uh, in need of a spiritual remake in his, his or her life, then the life of Jesus would be what that remake is about. And so then the comfort of God comes to those who mourn over their spiritual poverty. Uh, then the, it comes when a person is able to repent and say, you know, I know I need to turn around in a better direction. So repentance being turning away from one thing, turning toward another. Uh, when a person recognizes the difficulties and the negative things that have happened in their lives based upon the sin or the rebellion that they've been living under, uh, then they mourn over that. And then the comfort of God's forgiveness and God's uh, new plan for them unfolds, and that is the comfort of God. We also looked at how there are those who, of course, grieve or mourn over a loss of some kind in their lives. And so this is another application for those who mourn, that God's comfort, His strong comfort comes to those who have lost a loved one. Just today, I found, I found out that uh, Frances Hamilton's son died yesterday. And so she was all broken up in her heart over the loss of her son. It's her only son. And so she was grieving, and we prayed with her that the Lord would bring comfort to her uh, in His compassion for her loss. And so there is an application for God bringing comfort to those who mourn as there's a loss that's occurred as well. Keep Francis in your prayers because she had to go into the hospital herself down at Vanderbilt because she had a fever and hopefully it's not from the virus. But uh, she is a person that we love dearly. She's not able to come to church. She's homebound. But keep Francis Hamilton in your prayers if you would. Here's what Jesus said next to his disciples. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So we're going to explore these beatitudes uh, of Jesus that are given in a progressive manner. After a person has mourned over their spiritual poverty, the next thing is that they begin to see a better way of, of doing things and, and a better attitude or uh, be able to keep their emotions uh, under control because they begin to see that, that that's what Jesus did and how he lived. And so once the pretentiousness of the self-focused life has been acknowledged and mourned, 
We're then ready for this step three, where God's comfort has turned into a better assessment of oneself in terms of meekness. So this discussion point, guys, uh, to begin with here, is uh, let's talk about what being meek is and what it is not. Uh, unfortunately, a contemporary concept of meekness is that of weakness, uh, and that's the view that sometimes people have of meekness, that that's what it is. But it's really not, or, or that it's one who is demurring and submissive in his or her personality. So, Tony and Josh, what, what do you guys uh, think that, uh, about this common idea about meekness? Where does that come from? Why do people believe that? Yeah, you know, I think part of it is just, you know, I don't think it's because meek rhymes with weak, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, you know, it yeah. probably doesn't help, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, when, when we think of meek in kind of the contemporary way that we use meek, sometimes it's, it's more uh, rooted in uh, timidity. Mm -hmm. Maybe a shyness, right. uh, you know, kind of a lack of strength. I think there's just those things that are just tied to it the way we kind of use it in, in the mm -hmm. modern day. Maybe that, that doesn't contribute well to it, mm -hmm. you know, in this verse anyway. Yeah, yeah. gentle mm -hmm. Jesus, meek and mild, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I think of, I think people in our culture sometimes feel pressure to succeed and to get ahead and, and to... to um, measure up to what they think they're supposed to. Mm -hmm. I think I think a lot of young people feel stress about that if you read, you know, surveys and stories. So I think there's a there can be a societal pressure to feel like I've got to take control and 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 be successful and get ahead and, and even if that means kind of doing it in a way that's that's you know, emotionally out of control maybe, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, so it's uh it's, it's something that has to be redefined for people, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and to do that, we actually probably need to go back a long time ago and look at uh, what, in an more ancient days, as to what they thought meekness really meant. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, during uh, the days of Aristotle, for instance, uh, he taught that, that meekness is the, the, the mean between extreme passion and extreme passivity. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it described a person who was angry at the right time and uh, not angry at the wrong time. Uh, so uh, it is the difference between selfish anger, really, uh, and selfless anger. Uh, and William Barclay said that meekness should describe a person who knows when to speak and when not to speak, when to be silent, uh, especially if strong emotions are, are being experienced. So discussion point for that is if meekness is a desired trait for a person who embraces the kingdom of heaven, uh, and Jesus personifies the kingdom of heaven. Are there examples of that meekness in Jesus that he exhibited as an example to his disciples? Can you guys think of some times when, when the, they would have maybe even shook their heads and said, you know, why doesn't Jesus get upset about this? You know? <laughs> yeah, you know, I think, I think there's a lot of examples. You know, I almost feel like maybe there, there is some correlation too to the words that Jesus said, you know, to be as innocent as a dove, but as wise as a serpent. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, that's always, there's, there's a cool, a coolness in a good way, a level headedness about it. Uh, and, and, uh, but yeah, you know, anytime I look at the Lord and some of the interactions that he had with the disciples and, 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 uh, you know, the very things that he suffered for us, uh, when there were those that were, you know, standing before him, either torturing him, questioning him, questioning uh, who his father was, you know, when, you know, was his father the devil? Uh, I think if there wasn't a lack of, uh, of meekness, if there wasn't a lack of level-headedness, a very prideful person that doesn't have meekness could have lashed out and said, do you know who I am? <laughs> that would not be meekness. Mm -hmm. uh, but the Lord was just such a great model of just a level-headedness that even when there was the pettiness or the torture or whatever it may have been, that was happening, that was coming from another human being, he was able, he was able to listen with the right heart and respond the right way. Yeah. And that, that disposition that I think, you know, is trying to be expressed by the word meekness here, in, you know, at least in the Greek. Yeah, because even when somebody challenged him or even called him a liar or you know, uh, being of the devil or whatever, yeah. I don't think he screamed at those people. Yeah. He may have responded to them, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, and, and corrected them. But I don't think he yelled at him, yeah. you know, or, yeah. or screamed at him like some people would. Oh, yeah. so cool. Yeah. So meekness oh, yeah. would be not losing your cool <laughs> right. when somebody that you're talking to is losing theirs. So yeah, yeah. and and maybe uh, 
I think about timing. You know, there were times where Jesus had a strong response to something that was appropriate. You know, he, mm-hmm. he t- turned over the tables in the, in the temple when the money changers were disrespecting the Lord. And, you know, he would say strong words to the Pharisees, but then there were times where the disciples would want to do something strong, and it was the wrong timing or the wrong person to which he was doing that. So I mm-hmm. think it matters when and who you're addressing. And Jesus, of course, had a mm-hmm. sense of that, you know. Right. You know, I'm thinking of the time that uh, he was on the Sabbath, you know, and the Pharisees were just, the scribes and Pharisees were just watching to see if he was going to heal on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And there just happened to be this guy with the withered hand there. And uh, and Jesus, it said, the scripture tells us that he was angry. And he's, you know, he was angry because he knew their thoughts, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what they were thinking. But he did not really focus on those guys. Mm -hmm. His complete focus was on the man with the withered hand. Mm-hmm. And he was not intimidated by his detractors. Instead, he harnessed his emotions that may have been, he may have been tempted to come out there, yeah. but he harnessed that and controlled that so that he could concentrate on his ministry mm-hmm. uh, and healing that man. He asked him to step forward and he hold out his hand. And when he did that, Jesus healed his hand. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, they, they began to really challenge him then and yell at him or whatever about what he had done. He had healed on the Sabbath, you know. And the scripture tells us that he just kind of disappeared. You know, he, mm-hmm. he retreated. It's like he just kind of left it alone. But he could have really gotten a big tangle with those guys, oh, yeah. but he didn't do it. Mm-hmm. So it's a, he, he, there are several examples like that in, in scripture. So, um, well, here's an example. Uh, Josh mentioned the disciples kind of losing their cool a few times. Mm-hmm. Here's an example uh, where the disciples failed to be meek and how Jesus told them a better way uh, and to get back on focus, basically. And this takes place in Samaria where Jesus and his disciples had gone and they had been refused hospitality in this one town. Mm-hmm. Uh, nobody had offered to give them a place to sleep or nobody had offered them food or anything. Mm-hmm. And so there were a couple of disciples that were really upset about that. And so, uh, Josh, how about you reading that, those verses? All right. Out of Luke chapter 9, verse 54. All right. Uh, and when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. So um, what's the role of meekness here, or the lack of meekness? Uh, You know, it's obvious they didn't have much meekness because they wanted to kill all these people. (laughs) Fire down from heaven. I mean, that's pretty tough, you know. So what did, how did Jesus, you know, straighten them out in terms of understanding their objective being uh, uh, well, kept before them? I think they tried to spiritualize their lack of meekness, right? They tried yeah. to say, we're going to be like Elijah and call down. For, so they tried to make <laughs> it holy, you know, what they were doing. And Jesus said, this is what the kingdom of God's about. It's about yeah. my purpose. So, yeah, he kind of shot down their over-spiritual. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's an interesting take yeah. on that, Josh. Yeah. I like that, yeah. uh, that they... <laughs> They were thinking maybe Elijah was one of their heroes. Yeah. They wanted to be a little bit like him there. So, <laughs> Yeah, you know, and, and I'm thinking, I, I've written this down earlier, just sort of when I've always thought of meekness, and one of my favorite writers, Henry Nowen, especially it's contextual here in that um, they're upset about hospitality, right, that wasn't received. And, and Henry Nowen, he wrote, uh, I forget which book it was, but he wrote that uh, part of spiritual, true spiritual growth is a move from hospitality, I'm sorry, from hostility to mm-hmm. hospitality, oh, right. right? So, like so that. that's that's yeah. a nice. It's it's just part of those spiritual things that happen. That there's that movement, and this is actually the opposite, right? Mm-hmm. So this is this is a a move to hostility. Mm-hmm. And back to your point, your question, Jerry. I mean, what happens here is is yes, there's hostility. They have not made the move to hospitality. They're right. not there emotionally. Yet the Lord is able to take it back to saying, hey, let's get back to what matters most, which Mm -hmm. is the Son of Man is here to save. You know, we're here to save, not destroy lives. And that's why I'm here. So because he's able to kind of keep that level-headed, level-headedness, he's able to get him back centered, you know, on what's most important. And sometimes, Mm -hmm. you know, even today you hear people ranting and raving, you know, Mm -hmm. toward people who have certain types of behavior, you know, Mm -hmm. and and you want to just say to them, "Look, look at this story. You know, between Jesus and his disciples, what is that saying to you? 
Yeah. You know, that uh, you've been placed here by the Lord to bring people into a, a uh, reconciled relationship with God. Yelling and raving at those people is not going to, to be uh, yeah. much of an invitation to come to the Lord. Well, and that's so, true. That's true. Um, meekness is a better way to in, invite people. I think, I think especially yeah. of John as, as being a passionate person. And so in his flesh, that weakness can look like this, but then you think about what happened to him later in his life. He's the apostle that wrote about love, 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 you know what I'm saying? And so eventually I think he, obviously he did make that move that you just said. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's good to see how the Bible shows us how he did move from this place to that place that you described. Yeah, yeah. It's also interesting that James and John were the sons of Zebedee, who was they were called the sons of thunder. Now mm -hmm. that, that uh, description of Zebedee was probably there for a reason. Mm -hmm. And I think they could even say to the Lord sometimes, you know, we're just like our dad, you yeah. know. <laughs> We've got some thunder in us yeah. too. Yep. And, uh, but they, oh, that's kind of a cop out when you stop to think about it. Hey, I'm this way because that's the way I was raised, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, some, some of those things the Lord wants to, to cure us of, you know, those things mm -hmm. that have remained. Well, um, uh, Moses was a great leader, mm -hmm. um, and uh, he probably was the most, is most, the most revered person in Judaism, uh, even today. Uh, and uh, the scripture actually says in Numbers 12, 3, now the man Moses was very meek, more than all men who were on the face of the earth. So clearly, meekness is not weakness, because mm -hmm. you have the, mm -hmm. one of the strongest men who ever lived in terms of strong leadership, and he's, he's, he was the meekest man who ever lived, according to, this, uh, to Numbers 12.3. Now, the discussion point here is that according to what we know of the history of Moses, was he always a meek man? Just think back to his younger years. And, and, uh, and then, of course, we're going to look also at the end of his life. And uh, we'll save that for a little bit. But, but at the beginning of his life, was, was he a meek man back then? Or what happened to him that brought him to the point of being of meekness, you know? What do you guys think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, he obviously at one point killed a man, you know, and had to flee Egypt and had to spend, you know, 40 years of his life on the backside of the wilderness. So I think, um, you know, he, he went from kind of being in the palace to being a shepherd. And uh, it, it seems like that was a really humbling, you know, experience. And I I always think it's interesting that Moses was, I believe, 80 years old, you know, when God called him into ministry. And so there was a lot of life experience that brought him to that point before God called him. Yeah, you know, even at the, at the burning bush, mm -hmm. you know, if God gave me a burning bush and spoke to me <laughs> out of it, I'd be going, hey, man, <laughs> that's pretty cool. You know, what did I do to deserve this? Yeah. But uh, Moses kind of said, you know, I, I'm not your guy, you know. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't taking himself very seriously was he right which is an indication of meekness i think yeah i mean even even with the debate with the lord when he was trying to get his brother yeah to kind of be the front man you mm -hmm. know moses was willing to stand in back and let aaron do all the talking you know mm -hmm. and the lord i've always really respected the lord for a lot of reasons obviously yeah. but with that interaction with moses and how the lord deals how god himself deals with moses even in a very meek fashion when god is kind of Mm -hmm. saying, you can do this, you know, you can do this. Moses saying, I can't do this, I can't do it. And the way that the Lord pushes and pulls there even is very meek. But, you know, when you, when you think of Moses, and I think of Moses, um, and how close he was and what a friend he was with the Lord mm -hmm. and how they spoke to one another. Mm -hmm. um, and where he was, you know, Josh, you mentioned, you know, when he, he killed, you know, the the guard or, or whoever mm -hmm. was there with all the Israelites when they were imprisoned mm -hmm. uh, and working. Uh, when he killed that individual, the meekness, you know, might not have been, mm -hmm. he might not have been spot on there. Mm -hmm. But all that time with God through the course of his life, um, he was dealing with some of the most petty complaints day in, day out. And the way in which he managed those up until, you know, the day that he, it was a day he blew it, right? Yeah. Uh, but I, I, to me, part of it is when you're around the Lord like that, mm -hmm. you probably get this. You mm -hmm. really get this. And he walked so closely with the Lord. Maybe that helped him to understand how to carry that meekness and that gentle disposition with the Israelites, mm -hmm. even when their hearts were as hard as mm -hmm. could be. 
-hmm. but he was still there for him, you know. Yeah, he had to put up with a lot, you know. When you're dealing with a million followers, you know, people, (laughs) you're leading a million people through a wilderness, uh, and, uh, you know, they had to put up with a a lot of murmuring and complaining, and, and, uh, you know, at at the end of his life, he seems to have lost patience with that pretty much. Mm And he, he got to the point where the people were complaining about not having water, I guess, to drink. And, mm-hmm. and God spoke to him and said, well, Moses, you know, go speak to that rock over there. And it, this had happened before. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a new thing. Uh, it happened before. He said, go speak to the rock and water. You'll get water, you know, basically. And, and, but he was so angry with the people. I'm, I'm not sure but what he, he would say. Lord, let's just let them sweat this out. <laughs> you know, let's let him just be thirsty for a while longer. Mm-hmm. And he, he became kind of punitive, and, and he took his rod and he struck the, the rock twice in anger. Mm-hmm. Uh, and at that point, he was no longer you know, leading out of meekness. He was leading in anger mm-hmm. and uh, from a punitive position toward mm-hmm. the people. You can't lead people and punish them at the same time mm-hmm. with anger. You know, and um, uh, that's even true about pastors. You know, if a pastor gets upset about something, he starts preaching his anger, you know, mm-hmm. in front of a congregation. You're, you're pretty much going to lose that congregation before it's over with, you know. So mm-hmm. meekness is, is very important. But he he lost his ability to lead, and that was when the Lord decided, well, okay, it's time, your time to come on home, Moses. Mm-hmm. And he, you know, the leadership was turned over to Joshua. And the thing about Moses, it, when he lost his meekness, he lost the opportunity also to go into the land of inheritance. Mm-hmm. He lost the opportunity to lead the people into the promised mm-hmm. land. So it's interesting in this particular mm-hmm. verse, you know, it even says, you know, here uh, that uh, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Yeah. And you, you want to mm-hmm. think about that sometimes with Moses, you know, what, what he lost out on because he lost meekness, you know. Yeah. Uh, I, think, I think it also yeah. reminds you that Moses was a human that was sinful, you know, because mm-hmm. you, mm-hmm. you know, he did have this unprecedented experience with God, unlike almost anything anybody's ever done before Jesus came, you know. And so I think, you know, the Bible's real, and it doesn't portray Moses as this deified fi- figure. You know what mm. I'm saying? He was still a man right. capable of really messing up, which is a good reminder. That's true. You know, you know? and I, I, every time I think of the whole meekness thing, too, I don't know where I read it a long time ago, and, and maybe, maybe it was just new to me at the point when I read it, but um, someone was talking about that whole uh, Jesus meek and mild thing that you said earlier, right. Jerry. Yeah. And, and the reminder was that Jesus Christ endured the cross. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was anything but weak. Right. I mean, he was all strength. In fact, right. you know, when John sees, yeah. sees him on Patmos, I mean, there he was standing, you know, as, and looked with the appearance as a lamb who had been slain, but he's living. Mm-hmm. I mean, our God is strong, you know. Mm-hmm. It's all strength. It's just mm-hmm. the right kind of strength, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, and he, there's an occasion, you know, when he knew he was meek enough to know when to speak and when to be silent mm-hmm. when he stood in front of the the high priest and he was being tried and those false accusers mm-hmm. were coming out and mm-hmm. and hurling abuse at him and falsely accusing him i mean i i know this about me if somebody were falsely accusing me of just about anything I would say, you're wrong, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. and I would pretty well probably try to straighten that person out, you know, mm-hmm. and I've done that a couple of times mm-hmm. <laughs> in my life, <laughs> mm-hmm. and I've actually had to go apologize to a couple of people for being too emotional about it, but, but mm-hmm. um, uh, so he, he, he didn't speak, uh, you know, he knew what his purpose was, what his, mm-hmm. what his uh, challenge was, and that was to go to the cross, mm-hmm. and he didn't want to do anything to take away from that. Mm-hmm. And so that was the ultimate choice of, of meekness, I guess you might mm-hmm. say. So let's let's look at this thing about inheriting the earth for a minute. Um, you know, we have uh, we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. The Scripture tells us that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, um, uh, what what do you think that this this might might allude to here about in the meek inheriting the earth? Uh, you know, is it is it just a futuristic thing where one of these days we will? be brought back to the earth with Jesus and he'll rule for a thousand years and, you know, and we'll inherit the earth as his, you know, his followers. Or what, what do you think, uh, does it mean more than that? Does it have a more contemporary meaning to it? 
I mean, I think it has a very practical everyday meaning because I think of myself and, and I think a lot of us, it's, we tend to want to have control of life, take control. Mm -hmm. And so the, the practical thing for me is, am I taking control and not trusting God to take care of my life? Like it, it sort of exposes your idols. Like what, what stresses you to the point where you want to take control, mm -hmm. maybe fear, maybe wanting to get ahead, whatever. You know, when you look at where Jesus is quoting this from in Psalm 37, the context around it is the evil getting ahead, mm -hmm. and the psalm is struggling with the fact of, why are they getting ahead and I'm struggling, and, and, and I need to do something, or God, you need to do something. And so I, I mm -hmm. think of the issue of control, and, and, and it's very hard for us sometimes on a practical day-to-day -day basis to say, God, I give you control because I, I, I can't get ahead as far as I think I can with whatever I think I'm going to do here, you know? Right. Yeah, you know, maybe part of that, too, is, is a misunderstanding around power, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what power is, what power isn't. Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, when I, when I think of, uh, you know, if you think of uh, some analogies that are out there for, say, you know, there are plow horses and there are show horses, you know, in the world there some that are just all show and then there's people out there that are just plowing day in and day out and they end up they end up turning the earth and planting and they have something that's lasting mm -hmm. and and that show horse you know not all show, show horses aren't you know plowing too but but uh but but the point is is that the plow horse uh, uh those that are kind of walking in humility uh those that are using uh it's a bad way to put it, but but those that have an understanding about what power is or isn't, you know, I think of uh, I think of the most influential people in the world. Uh, one one individual uh, by the name of D. Hawk had talked said this about power. He had said that a true power, if it's used, you never had it. You know, it's <laughs> you know, it's it, it's it's either there or it's not there, and. And, and I, maybe that's getting a little too philosophical and it's tough to tie that kind of thought down. But the point is, is that, is that someone that has to say, I'm your boss, they just kind of gave up all their authority. You should never have to say you're someone's supervisor, you're mm -hmm. someone's a subordinate, or here's the hierarchy, is that people know what your role is if you're doing what God's called you to do in this world, or if you're doing what your organization has you to do, or whatever it may be. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, to me, at some level, there's an inheritance of the earth in that a gentle disposition, humility, uh, you know, uh, not being harsh, which ten tends to be the opposite almost of meekness. So there's a reward for that. There's rewards, yeah. and you yeah. inherit something from that by yeah. walking in that that uh, that humility that's quite godly, you know. Yeah. yeah, there's almost, again, there's almost a paradoxical thought there. The more you try to get control, the less you actually inherit. You know, you mm -hmm. think you are, mm -hmm. but you're digging your hole <laughs> deeper. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> you know, I heard somebody say one time, uh, you can either win or get the credit. Mm -hmm. But you can't do both. You know, you can mm -hmm. either win or get the credit. Mm -hmm. And I think meekness means that you, you you don't you're not that interested in getting the credit, but you do want to to win. And the that's what inheriting the earth would be alluding to. Mm -hmm. That you the win here is that you're growing, you're gaining ground in your life mm -hmm. by being meek and not letting your emotions you know mm -hmm. kind of screw it up for you. You yeah. know, mm -hmm. so it's uh. Uh, and I, I had this thought too: is how how would the promise of the meek inheriting the earth, this gaining ground idea, mm -hmm. apply to like personal relationships such as marriage? You know, do you think marriages sometimes suffer because somebody in the marriage is not acting with meekness? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> is that I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. you know, no, I'm mad I could yeah. tell you some stories. <laughs> you know, I, I, yeah. our, first, our first year of marriage, I, I remember Vicki and I were uh, arguing about something, and I never wanted to give ground, I, I, which is not meekness, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so and she, she kind of held her ground, too, but I, don't, I have no idea what we were arguing about. Yeah. But I was upset. Maybe she was winning the argument. <laughs> and I was upset about that. But uh, I, I remember getting so heated up, you know, that I slammed the back door to the house, going out into the carport, and the glass broke out of the door. <laughs> and I, immediately, I started becoming more meek. <laughs> so I got in the car, though, and I, I revved up the engine, you know, and I 
pulled out the driveway and screeched my tires going down the street. Well, about two blocks away, I said to myself, this is the stupidest thing you've ever done. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I turned around, came back, went in, and she was laughing, you know, sitting on the floor laughing. And she <laughs> said, <laughs> I said, man, I just acted like a fool, you know. Yeah. And, and uh, I learned a lesson there mm -hmm. that, you know, losing your cool it, oh. do, it does not uh, reward you with the better marriage. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that, you know, that 50-50 worldview, they call it, you know, yeah. if you give 50%, I'll give 50%. You know, yeah. that, that it doesn't work in marriage or in relationships, you know, because the Lord's, you know, he calls us to, with, with your, your spouse to give 100% all the time, you know, That's even right. if they give 20%. Yeah. But you can see that kind of translate across relationships. Mm. Um, and then, and then also, when we get into that fifty-fifty worldview, you can see what happens when we polarize, right? With debates, you know, somebody was in the middle, then suddenly they're back the extreme mm -hmm. because somebody fought with them and backed <laughs> them into a corner, you know. Right. So I think your your question's good, Jerry. I mean, yeah. it also takes me back to you know even to other biblical figures. I was thinking about inheriting the earth, uh, Daniel, mm -hmm. and. Uh, his meekness, I mean, he in three different successive kingdoms, I mean, how many politicians, you know, end up hanging with a president three times like Daniel yeah. did? And essentially, he would be given things like, oh, you're second in command, or he would be given some type of accolades. But the whole time, he's giving the Lord all the glory, yeah. you know. But he was inheriting the earth. And I was thinking also of Joseph, too. Mm -hmm. and his meekness mm -hmm. and his inheritance of the earth, right? But, you know, back to your original question, I mean, mm -hmm. absolutely in marriage and our relationships because not all of us are going to be a Joseph in this world. Yeah, if you right want to right gain right. ground in your marriage, you know, your marriage to be better, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then, then you have to walk in meekness, you know, that controlled, uh, being able to control your emotions uh, mm -hmm. even when they get heated up or, or whatever. Yeah. You know, there's another application I, I, I want to make. I know we're taking a lot of time on this one uh, That's good. beatitude. That's good. But, but um, you know, I think that has some, some pretty earth-shaking, you know, application mm -hmm. here too. Uh, you know, one of my heroes is a guy named E. Stanley Jones who wrote about the kingdom of God. He yeah. has a great book about the kingdom of God. Well, E. Stanley Jones became friends with, with Gandhi, uh, who was you know, really uh, looked up to by the people of India to try to lead them into independence. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there have been a lot of violence that have been tried uh, over time. But uh, as uh, E. Stanley Jones talked to Gandhi, he, he, re he began to unfold the Sermon on the Mount with, to him and, you know, about the blessed are the meek, for they mm -hmm. shall inherit the earth. And, and uh, he convinced Gandhi that, a, that uh, nonviolence was the best route, a more meek approach uh, to the issue was the best route to take. Well, guess what? Later on, there was a guy named Martin Luther King Jr. who, who became familiar right. with uh, Gandhi and how E. Stanley Jones had, had instructed Gandhi from the Sermon on the Mount. And he began to believe as well that the Civil Rights Movement would have much greater success, that there would be an inheriting the earth kind of thing, uh, gaining ground that could take place much better without violence uh, and so that's how he wound up leading this civil rights movement that was somewhat successful. It's still mm -hmm. uh, under construction, yeah. but, uh, you know, it was somewhat successful because he understood that nonviolence, uh, a more meek approach to things, uh, would probably get the job done better. Yeah. And, uh, and the, he could inherit the ground. So That was really good. And, earth. you know, and I, I appreciate yeah. that. And, you know, uh, e. Stanley Jones, uh, I tend to be a fan of as well. He, uh, you know, he had a lot of influence on Gandhi, you know, and sadly, you know, Gandhi just was unable to give God a, a solitary throne, regrettably. Right. But, um, but Gandhi every morning, um, you know, thanks to the influence of, I'm sure, uh, God being involved in this, but then E. Stanley Jones, um, you know, Gandhi every morning would meditate on the Sermon on the Mount, like three in the morning, I think. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That. that was part of yeah. his practice. Wow. Yeah. That's powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it works. You know, what Jesus yeah. taught his disciples, you know, other people have become students of as well, even if they mm -hmm. didn't become devoted to Christ himself. Yeah. Um, so just a, a, a discussion point. I don't know that I want to get into this very dramatically, <laughs> but, you know, we have this issue going on, this crisis that we're dealing with in our world right now with COVID-19 and, and um, a lot of people with strong opinions about things 
our sparring and there, there are protests going on, you know, mm -hmm. about whether to open up the economy and those kind of things. And, but uh, uh, there's a lot of powerful people trying to lead us through this, like Moses, you know, <laughs> led the people of Israel. Um, you know, have you seen examples? Uh, I don't want to talk about, let's not talk about examples of the lack of meekness. But have you seen people involved in this whole thing that you could say, you know, that's, that's maybe what Jesus would do in a case like this. And I want to start us out by saying that I have gained great admiration for the governor of Tennessee uh, because, you know, there have been people who have been critical of him and who have really worked him over, you know, and all this kind of thing. But he has kept his, deme his demeanor, has remained meek through this whole thing. And he just simply speaks what he believes Mm -hmm. And he moves on and he makes decisions. I think he makes decisions uh, in an atmosphere of prayer as well. But I, I think Governor Lee has demonstrated meekness uh, mm -hmm. in how he's led this, this state through this crisis. You know, I, I think about Solomon's prayer where he said, Lord, I don't even know how to come in or go out, mm -hmm. you know. And I, and I think when you're, you know, my prayer for anybody in a leadership and something is complicated as this you know where you have people getting sick and not healthy and people not being able to work and how do you reconcile all of that you know i i think there's a need for great wisdom to mm -hmm. walk through that and so i think my prayer for a leader in a time like this would be humble you know mm -hmm. be humility and, and recognize i don't have all the answers i'm not in competition with anybody else here i i need wisdom because people's lives are affected you know when you're mm -hmm. in a position like that you realize all of a sudden, as, as, a, as an elected person in, the sense in our country, you, have a, you can really influence dramatically what's happening in people's lives. And so I just I think what Solomon prayed is there's obviously he received great wisdom from the Lord because of that, you know. Yeah. It's true. You know, I, I think of um, I think of, you know, a few weeks back, we had that mayoral declaration on a Sunday morning that tended to be a real bottoming out for a lot of people you know, yeah. in our city, mm -hmm. a lot of fear. Um, and, and it was a challenging time. So for essential businesses uh, that, that stayed open while mm -hmm. all their colleagues went back to their homes to work, mm -hmm. that was a very challenging time for leaders. And, mm -hmm. you know, there were a lot of leaders out there, um, you know, that, that I think, you know, recognized a couple of things. Uh, one was that the way in which we process fear is very different and to be patient with people um, because we don't know. Uh, you know, we don't know how someone processes through anxiety or what they may be carrying with this or the fear mm -hmm. uh, or even the fairness of it all. And, you know, there are people working from home. There's people not able to work from home. And what does that mean, you know? And so, so to me, what I've appreciated in, in just paying attention to leaders is, is people being very open to allow people to process through it. You know, what we're feeling maybe is going to be extremely different than what someone else is feeling. And when they lash out or when they're, they're very worried or their, you know, their position is different than our position on say how to use a mask. Right. I mean, there's, there's all these different things, but to allow that stuff to, to simmer and to not, you know, to not let us boil over. Right. As we respond to it, because maybe we see the world differently. Yeah. And you know, we've talked about uh, strong men in leadership mm -hmm. like Moses and, mm -hmm. of course, the Lord and, and even Governor Lee. And, but this Dr. Burks, this, very, this woman that uh, stands up there every day mm -hmm. and talks about the crisis from a medical point of view and, and all of this, I have just gained so much admiration for how she handles herself. You know, and she just basically states the facts and gives encouragement to people to do the right thing. Uh, and uh, there's a strong woman mm -hmm. leader right there yeah. uh, that I, I just happen to have a sense of admiration for. Yeah. So. You know, I, I don't know anything about her personally, but I have heard her be admired um, for now for several weeks. Uh, I mean, I think both, I think that the doctoral staff and, or the doctors in, in general have been admired, but I have heard that about her specifically, mm -hmm. that uh, she, she is truly ministering to people with that level-headedness and that, that gentle disposition Meekness. to where it's not, I'm not, my blood pressure doesn't go up every single time <laughs> she says something. I can listen to yeah. it. I can process. I've listened to her. My wife listens to her mm -hmm. every day. And I do believe that, that she is something about her disposition mm -hmm. provides a peace even though there's a storm. Right. 
because there's a calmness about it. Yes, right? it is. And I think that that uh, that meek uh, that meekness that's not weakness is mm-hmm. coming through, and it's it's helping to gain ground in this situation. Yeah, actually, quite loving yeah. in its own way. Mm-hmm. And people people inherently trust and even confide in people that lead with some control over their emotion, mm-hmm. you know? Um, you know, I mean, I, uh, I, I've, I've, I've seen that with you at times where I, I, I feel like people have come to you over the years and trust you because they have seen you not, you, you're, you have empathy, but, I, but there's a level of control over that emotion. And I think there's, people have trust when they when they see that do you know what i'm saying because they know that person is stable mm-hmm. <laughs> and mm-hmm. so that's a reassuring thing i think maybe that's what you guys are describing mm-hmm. too is yeah. not that any of us do that perfectly right. but there there is a sense of trust when mm-hmm. you see somebody that is empathetic but not uh losing control themselves prone know? to an yeah. emotional roller coaster yeah. or whatever. you know i had a young woman come to me one time and she confessed uh, some behavior problems mm-hmm. and behavior issues and and uh, she had tried to handle, resolve a problem in the wrong way. And uh, she said, are you going to throw me out of the church? I smiled at her and I said, no, I love you. <laughs> but I want to help you get over this. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think that's the nature of Jesus, you know, that meekness is, is, a, is a strong encouragement to people, like mm-hmm. you said. Yeah. Um, well, let's go to the next beatitude, uh, which is uh, describing the blessed life. If we see these Beatitudes as progressive steps, then we would say that the person who has become meek and is gaining ground, one of the things that's going to happen to them is they're going to begin to hunger and thirst after righteousness. Uh, and the scripture Jesus said, and when that person begins to hunger and thirst for righteousness, they will be filled with righteousness. You know, mm-hmm. that will come to them. Mm-hmm. And so the discussion point here is that uh, what does the word righteousness really represent here? Uh, what what does it mean to you? It means a lot of things in Scripture, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. we may want to talk about some of those. But uh, the hunger for righteousness and thirst for righteousness. First of all, what does hunger and thirst? What does that kind of bring to mind? You know, and when you when you're hungry, you know, and it, with me, it's more appetite than <laughs> hunger. <laughs> You know, mm. Most of us have never been hungry, you know, yeah. <laughs> truly hungry. Yeah. But when I feel that way uh, or thirsty, uh, all I can think about is getting something to eat, mm-hmm. you know, or something to drink. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I used to play a lot of tennis when I was in college. I get really hot in those hot days, and man, there was this this root beer place down the street that had these frosty mugs, and at one point, at some point. While I was playing tennis, that's all I can think about is go to get one of those, you know. <laughs> so righteousness, to, to have that thing of hunger and hungering, hungering and thirsting after righteousness, to where righteousness is so prominent in our mm-hmm. thoughts, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you guys think about that? I mean, I, I think <laughs> that we're hungry, and, it, and, and you're going to satisfy that hunger some way. Mm-hmm. And so I'm, I take this as... If we if we admit that we're hungry and we're going to satisfy that hunger some way, I think Jesus is saying direct it toward what is aligned with me, mm-hmm. you know. Because and you have many examples in Scripture where people take that hunger and align it toward the wrong thing, like Esau. That's kind of the classic picture, right? Where he takes the 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 the, the stew, the soup over his birthright because he was hungry and, and, and it was sort of a fleshly impulse. Mm-hmm. So I think Jesus is recognizing we all have this hunger. It's a matter of where do you direct that yeah. hunger? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, and like you said, you, we're going it, to, it's such a, it's a base, it's a basic need that's going to get filled. Mm-hmm. So it's going to get filled. Um, and, uh, and I'm thinking of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, uh, Money, getting paid, taking care of your family, eating, you know, like at the base of that pyramid that we all just mm-hmm. study in psychology class in high school or wherever. Um, but, you know, to me, I can't, I can't help, Jerry, but think about um, how off people were about what righteousness was at this mm-hmm. point. Because we know that's where it's leading as you work through the Sermon of the Mount. Part of it, not all right, together, right. Is, mm-hmm. is that what, what uh, you know, the Jews had come to believe what righteousness was. Right. And then Jesus, in a refreshing way, is saying, hungering for what that really means mm-hmm. is something special. 
yeah. you know. But 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 you all have gotten a little lost over the last you know couple hundred years, four hundred years, where you know the priests became scribes, the priests became Pharisees. They started writing all this additional stuff, you know, yeah. and all their literature around rules and regulations. Uh, that had so, you know, just so proliferated, it had exploded into what they thought righteousness was. And so then here's thought, the Lord, yeah. the Lord himself saying, yeah, there's a righteousness to hunger and thirst for, but he's about to tell them it's not like that of the scribes and the Pharisees, right? So, so the righteousness they wanted, they thought they wanted was, was the external yeah. keeping of the law. Yeah. And Jesus, later on, Jesus is going to say, you know, it's... <laughs> It, it's more of an internal thing, really, than an external mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. So one who's hungering and thirsting after righteousness will want their heart to be right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're yeah. actually going to be filled. Yeah. That thing that everybody's longing yeah. for, with this, this desire to be in right standing with God through all these wrong mechanisms and mm -hmm. rules, there's a way to be filled. You know, right. And they will be filled when they truly hunger for the righteousness. Now, the righteousness that Jesus gives, right? Because we'll, he'll give him our, he'll, he'll give us his righteousness exactly. at one point, right? And I, I want to read a, read a yeah, scripture yeah, that I think mm -hmm. aligns with that. Isaiah 55 says, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Mm. So I think that's it's at good. the heart of what Jesus mm -hmm. is saying. Yeah, it yeah. even uses the same, you know, analogy there of food, you mm -hmm. know, and, mm -hmm. but um, the spiritual food. Mm -hmm. I also think about righteousness meaning to be justified mm -hmm. to the point to where you're acceptable to God, that we want to be affirmed and access, you know, acceptable to God. Uh, and do we hunger for that acceptance? <clears throat> and uh, I think one of the things maybe on the mind of Jesus was something that was going to happen later on mm -hmm. when he went to the cross and he took up our sins upon himself, that he was going to make it possible for that which we hungered for, mm -hmm. that mankind hungered for, to, to be, to, they would be filled with that righteousness, that acceptance by God, that, that mm -hmm. justification, uh, mm -hmm. that the guilt would be expunged uh, from their sins, and they would have access to God the Father and know, be able to know God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So to hunger and thirst for righteousness is to hunger and thirst for, for accessibility to God Absolutely. without anything that gets in the way, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so to want to, to have that openness with the Lord. Uh, you know, when, when you don't have, a, when, when you got something that's wrong in your heart mm -hmm. with somebody, it's hard to get close to them. You're mm -hmm. afraid they're going to find out what's really there, you know. Yeah. But because of what Jesus did, you know, he took away those things that kept us from knowing God. And so hungering and mm -hmm. thirsting, to me, hungering and thirsting for righteousness is hungering to know God, mm -hmm. you know, and being in that condition yeah. of uh, for being forgiven and justified yeah. through what Jesus did. I love that because, that, you know, when I, when, I, when I think about just being right with God, how wonderful that is. Yeah. Because then that allows for closeness, to be close to God. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, just, it's, it's the place to be. It just never feels better than when you're, you're with Him, exactly. you know. Mm -hmm. And that's made possible because, because, uh, because we are right in right standing with Him. Mm -hmm. And so that we can be in a very close relationship with Him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's wonderful to be at that place, isn't it? It is. It sure is. Best um, place to be. So um, let's, let's, uh, let's look at uh, uh, this concept of, of the kingdom of heaven for a moment, uh, that Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is, is at hand, you know, representing himself. Mm -hmm. Being like him, and that's the whole objective. He does, of course, it's not in a prideful way of like uh, you guys need to be exactly like me. Uh, I saw a cartoon one time where it's this uh, showed this pastor, you know, and he and he had this dummy, you know, ventriloquist dummy sitting on his knee, uh, and he said, "I've I finally found the the perfect assistant pastor," <laughs> and this dummy was sitting on his knee, and it looked just like the pastor, <laughs> 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 you know. <laughs> 
And so Jesus wasn't saying that, you know, I'm going to make puppets out of you, mm-hmm. you know, so that you're going to be just like me in that way. But uh, uh, to hunger and thirst for righteousness, I think, would, is asking the question about everything. Well, what would Jesus do? Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, back in uh, 1896, mm-hmm. there was a book that was published entitled In His Steps. Uh, and uh, that actually the title is In His Steps, What Would Jesus Do? Mm-hmm. And it, was sold, it sold over three, 30 million copies, probably a lot more than that uh, since I looked. But, but uh, it's one of the all-time bestsellers. And it was about how a local pastor uh, asked his congregation to, to begin asking themselves that question uh, and um, about everything. And it transformed those people. Uh, and they began to be more like Jesus mm-hmm. because that was the focus of their hearts. That's what they hungered for. What they thirsted for was to be like their, their Lord. And I think the more we want to be like somebody, the more we begin to act like them. You know, I, I had a friend that, uh, a, a very close friend, and he had some young guys that he was mentoring, and they all admired him tremendously. And, and, you know, he was uh, slightly bow-legged, you know, and, and he kind of walked in a certain way and carried himself in a certain way. And one day I was watching him with these guys, and I looked, and they were walking the same way as him, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know? And uh, I was like, well, man, he's, he's teaching them more than he knows, yeah. <laughs> you know. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that's, that's when we hunger and thirst after righteousness, I think we're hungering and thirsting to be like Jesus. You know, mm-hmm. in our relationships, how we handle ourselves, you know, what we do with our lives. So, um, guys, um, you want to talk a little more about that? I, I don't know that we have time to no. to do mm-hmm. "Blessed Are the Merciful." Maybe next time. tonight. Yeah. It's a pretty big subject. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that so, good. is it okay with you if we wait till sounds next good. week? That sounds yeah. good to get into that, and then we'll get into "Blessed Are the Pure in Heart" and "Blessed Are the." peacemakers and mm-hmm. some of those things as well. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's been, it's been good to talk about these things. And I heard some things coming out of us that uh, were unexpected, you know, mm-hmm. uh, were pleasant surprises. Uh, and so it's good to, to just kind of sit back sometimes and just not stick uh, closely to the notes, but to <laughs> give opportunity to, to have something over, you know, spill over from our hearts mm-hmm. in this. Mm-hmm. So is there anything about the, these two Beatitudes that stand out to you, especially after our discussion tonight, that that uh, you you would uh, want to apply to your own life a little more than you have. Yeah, go ahead, Josh. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, to me, uh, it's it's good. It's really good. I think in timely, uh, the meekness I think is 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 especially timely because the the temperature is up. You know, all around us right now Mm -hmm. and so you know for me it's a reminder uh, you know it's very easy right now for that meekness to kind of go out go out the door because it's a pressure cooker for so many people including myself you know Mm -hmm. in in, on different days and there's just an amount of pressure and amount of stress that uh, not everyone is feeling in the world uh, but there are many that are uh, all you have to do is uh, pick up a newspaper, and by the time you put it down, you'll feel it. <laughs> so, so you feel a little edgy uh, or Yeah, so, so to or, me, yeah, you know, it's, whatever. you know, trying to yeah. every day to wake up in the morning and say, Lord, give me your spirit. Mm-hmm. Now I can say, give me your meekness. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, give me your spirit to do the things today that you need me to do and to be like him. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, because each day, uh, for those, uh, you know, that are working in businesses, and that's something I can attest to, uh, each day is a new challenge, and it's different each day. Right. And that's what a lot of people are facing. Uh, you know that are that are that happen to be in businesses, and I think that a lot of people are facing that even in regardless of what walk of life they're in. That there's that you you don't know what to expect the next day as we're kind of working through something no one's ever seen and it's unprecedented, mm-hmm. and so that it, it helps to keep a level head, and just and and a meek, gentle disposition through it all. It's probably only to our benefit. Mm-hmm. Okay. Josh, anything? Yeah, I mean, I kind of along the lines of what you both said is, um, you know, I found actually living out some of these things in the Beatitudes, it, 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 it's in the context of seeking God in His presence. You know, when you're in His presence, it makes sense to be meek. 
it makes sense to want righteousness. Mm -hmm. And when I'm kind of doing my thing, sometimes it doesn't make sense. Like emotionally, do you know what I'm saying? Like you, Mm -hmm. you tend to slip back into what I do to take care of myself and my life. And when you really have, and I don't mean overly touchy feely, but when you have a, when you're walking in God's presence and you take time, just time to seek that, your perspective gets really different. And, and this starts to make sense what Jesus is saying. And he, he finally leads up to, blessed are the pure in heart for they will, you know, know, see God. And so when you begin to see God and know him, then this stuff kind of becomes like, not automatic, but it just makes sense. Mm-hmm. Whereas uh, apart from that, it, it's not just a head knowledge thing. It is an experiential thing that we seek with the Lord with these things, you know. Yeah. Hmm, well, I think I'm all along the same lines. You know, the meekness is what really speaks to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the idea of gaining ground. Mm-hmm. You know, that uh, not being in control of our... our I feel out of control sometimes right now. Mm-hmm. Do you ever mm-hmm. feel that? Oh, like, yeah. oh, I wish I could make something happen here. Mm-hmm. You know, but uh, when I start feeling that way, the best thing I can do is pray for something good to happen. Mm-hmm. And pray for the healing of those who are sick. And, and pray for the the decision makers in our country to have God's wisdom. Mm-hmm. And that is an active thing we can do when we feel frustrated mm-hmm. is to turn that frustration into a prayer, mm-hmm. you know, and I think that's a, a meekness uh, approach that is, uh, uh, that is going to help us as to gain ground. Uh, prayer is a powerful thing. Mm-hmm. And if we all believers began to pray, I think that God would use this crisis, and he already is, use the crisis to accomplish some really good things in our world spiritually. Mm -hmm. You know, we could see some spiritual gaining ground spiritually, Mm -hmm. inheriting the earth uh, as spiritual growth in our nation. Well, we're going to close in prayer tonight. Um, I'm going to pray for Frances Hamilton uh, and her family and what they're going through. And either one of you guys, you can choose something to pray about if you'd like. And then uh, how about, Tony, you close us out okay. in prayer. Okay. okay. Uh, Father, I just thank you today that you do comfort those who mourn. And today, uh, this little lady, Frances Hamilton, is mourning the death of her son, Joe. And uh, she's uh, crushed in spirit and brokenhearted. Uh, and uh, so, Lord, we just pray that your strong comfort would come to her. And we lift up uh, the rest of the family, too, uh, Kim and Pam and others in the family who are experiencing this loss as well. And we just uh, pray also for Frances to have healing come into her body. We pray that you protect her from harm, that the people at Vanderbilt Medical Center will be able to give her the assistance that she needs to help her get over this uh, sickness that she has. We ask this in Christ's name. Lord, I just ask that you would help us to apply these truths to our lives and our heart. And Lord, I just pray that your Holy Spirit um, would just work in us to produce your righteousness and your meekness. And Lord, again, I I lift up anybody listening that has just, you know, feels off kilter, feels like difficulty through this. I pray that your Holy Spirit would just fill their heart, that they would open to you your presence in their life, Lord, and that you would um, help these things to make sense and and be a reality in in their life. Well, Lord, we uh, we thank you, Father, just for your word, and we thank you, Lord, uh, for this this visit, this discussion tonight, Lord, and as as we sit here uh, in our church, we can't help but think about all of our friends that we have not uh, seen many we have not seen now for several weeks, Lord, and we just uh, we just give you thanks, Lord, for this sweet church family that we're a part of. Father, we lift up our leaders as we were talking about um, the particular doctor tonight and and her blessing to us. But Father, we lift up all of the leaders right now from local, state, uh, federal, all of those that are making decisions right now. We just pray, Lord, for your wisdom. We pray for your wisdom, Father, to be poured out um, across our world, but here in the United States with our nation, Lord, for those leading us. And Father, we also, too, ask, Father, for healing, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. 
And Father, be with those that are suffering and struggling. Father, be a protection and a shield, Lord, to health care workers. And Lord, tonight, we just want you to know that, that being, being right with you, Lord, being in right standing with you, Father, is just everything because then we're able to be close to you and to be a part of this beautiful kingdom of God that uh, Jesus, Lord, has taught us about. Even tonight, amen. 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 Well, that's, uh, we're going to say good night to everyone, and uh, Lord bless you all. And I uh, hope you'll have a blessed week.